Amen. If you can, air high five somebody, find your seat, say, I'm glad I'm in church today. Come on, tell somebody, I'm glad I'm in church. As a matter of fact, I tell them, I'm glad you're in church today, brother. So I'm glad you're in church today. But don't tell them God got a word for you. You got to receive it for yourself first. Can I get an amen? Come on, somebody. Well, guys, I got a special treat for you. I don't want to burn it too much time. But real quickly, just, just shout out to our praise team. Come on, come on, come on. Some worship right there. Amen. But, but what I want to do is I, I've asked, uh, this is the finale of our series. God can turn things around, man. It, it's just been awesome. God can't. How many of y'all believe God can turn things around in your life? How many of y'all believe God's already turning things around in your life? And you got to understand, often what I preach, I have to walk through. And so I want you to know that, but, I, but here's the good thing. I, I'm glad in that I'm walking with Jesus, and I'm about to walk through some things because God's turning it around. I receive it for me. Do you receive it for you? Can I get an amen? But I asked my beautiful wife, I said, would you close this out? Because I've already started preparing for the next series. And so how many guys know barbecue in the Bible goes good? Can I get an amen? And if it doesn't, you're about to find out that's some real good, that's spiritual food and soul food. You can't go wrong. Amen. Y'all make some noise for my beautiful wife as she comes up. Come on. The first lady to share a word with us. Thank you. Love you too. Amen. Oh my gosh. How do we sit down after that? That is all I have to say. How do we sit down after that? Man, God is so good. I hope you got in on that worship. I hope you, you're ready for the word. Are you ready? I mean, we've been ministered to already. Man, that was so good. God is so good. Doesn't he just know what we need? He is so faithful. He knows exactly what we need. Amen. Woo, I'm overwhelmed by his goodness. He is so good. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord, that you're here, that you're with us, Lord. Thank you that this morning, Lord, that you have a word for every person that's here. Thank you that we all will hear from you this morning a mighty word in due season. Thank you for your presence in this place. We are so grateful, Lord. I thank you, Father. That as we hear your word, Father God, it will get down deep inside of us and do a mighty work. We love you so much. We welcome you, Holy Spirit. Have your way. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen, amen and amen. Y'all know I always move this thing back because I don't know. I don't want to fly, fly off the stage up here, off the platform. I get excited sometimes, and I might go a little too far. Well, my honey will have to catch me over there, which would be okay. Mm, I want you to open with me in your Bibles to Isaiah 41. We're going to look at verse 10. Before we go there, I want to say thank you to my honey for this opportunity to get to. It's always a privilege and an honor to get to share the word of God. And so I'm grateful for the opportunity to be able to do that this morning. I'm reading out of the Living Bible. You're reading the verse that you have there. It says, fear not, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed. I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my victorious right hand. Amen. For several weeks, we've been in a series. In our series, it's right behind me here. God can turn things around. And I hope by now you're getting a picture of the kind of God that we serve. An amazing, mighty, powerful God. Who cares for you deeply I hope by now you're starting to see I hope by now you're starting to really believe that God can turn things around tell somebody God can turn things around we've talked about a supernatural turnaround we've talked about divine reversals a turn a sudden turnaround a season a turnaround season we've talked about the override button of God expecting turnaround moments and about how perseverance pays off and just hearing those sermon ser sermon titles just hearing those titles it gets me excited just hearing those titles gives me some hope and it gives me some expectation just hearing those things it puts a little wind in my sails and a little pep in my step just hearing that it presses the on button of the rocky theme song 
file in my mind. And I start feeling like, man, I can do anything. I can take on anything. I can win any fight. I can, I can persevere through anything and everything that, that, that the enemy throws at me. I can, I can be successful through whatever life throws my way because God is with me. And this morning, I want you to know that God is with you too. Tell somebody, God is with me. And God was with somebody that I want to look at this morning. I want to look at this morning at someone who must have heard the Rocky theme song playing in their mind countless of times. For starters, they were born into a dysfunctional family. Now, I know none of you can relate because your family's got it together. There are no issues in your family. So I know this is going to be hard for you to relate to, but, 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 but let's try, okay? Work with me here. Because it wasn't the case for this person we're going to look at this morning. I mean, in their family, you got people lying when they find themselves in a hard spot, compromising on things, putting their spouses in danger to save themselves. You, you got full-on selfishness going on in this family right here, okay? You've got deception. You've got tricksters cheating their family out of their inheritances, their money. You've got family member on the run because their sibling got murder on their mind because they are out for revenge, okay? You've got parents playing favorites. Mind you, the majority of these people got it together, but clearly there was some dysfunction going on here. And now we're gonna look today as someone who came from that kind of a background, that kind of a family background, who pertaining to their life now was hated. They were betrayed. They were mistreated. They were kidnapped. They were abandoned. Yeah, this is one person. They were sold as a slave, and as if that wasn't enough, they were sold for cheap. Now, it's bad enough you get sold into slavery, human traffic, but then you're sold for cheap, like you weren't even worth much. They were sexually harassed. They were lied about. They were framed. They were in prison, sent to prison for a crime they didn't even commit. In fact, they were punished for doing the right thing. Sounds a lot like some stuff that happens in our day. Right is called wrong and wrong is called right. And if you're committing crimes, if you're a criminal, there's no accountability. But on the other hand, if you haven't been proven to do anything wrong, you're guilty until proven innocent. Sounds a lot like what's going on, but let me get back to this person. They're punished for doing what's right. They're imprisoned for nothing. And then they're forgotten by the person that they helped while they were in that situation, while they were in that prison. And if we're not careful, we'll just glaze over the story of their life. We'll just glaze over the account of their life as it's just a little Bible story that we heard of. Yeah, that, I know that little Bible story. And we'll miss the huge, huge implications of their response to all these serious events that helped, that took place in their lives. And theirs is, is not just a little, a little story that you heard one day. It's not just a little Bible story. It's huge. Their story had huge implications on their life. Their story has huge implications for us, too. If you didn't know it by now, I'm talking about Joseph. And this morning, we're going to lean into the story of Joseph. We're going to gather life lessons from Joseph. And we're going to learn what happens in our lives when we know that God is with us. Tell somebody, God is with me. So today, I want to speak to you on the subject, fighting for the promise. Fighting for the promise. Turn with me in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 37. Genesis 37. We're going to start reading with verse 1. It says, Now Jacob dwelt in the land where his father was a stranger. In the land of Canaan, this is the history of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brothers. And the lad was with the sons of Billa and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. His father's wives. Well, that's a whole other story. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to his father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children. Israel is Jacob. His name was changed to Israel. Israel and Jacob, same person. He loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age. Also, he made him a tunic of many colors. 
But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. He loved him more. He was, he was a child of his old age. Not only was he a child of his old age, but he was, he was, his mama was Rachel. And like, you know, that's like who he really, that's my favorite. Okay, that's who I love. So it's a connection. And she had, pa- she had passed away. And that was a connection to her. So once again in this family, we see some favoritism going on here. And it's not covert. It's full on in your face favoritism that is going on here. I mean, there's a dozen children and one coat. You got Joseph. You got 10 half brothers, one half sister, and one coat. What you gonna do with one coat? That was already a recipe for disaster. You know, back in their day, everybody had a coat, everybody had a tunic. But they were short sleeve, knee length, and plain. But not Joseph's. Tell somebody, not Joseph's. His was long sleeve, ankle length, and it had some bling to it. It was loud and proud. It made him stand out. And I'm sure every time his brothers saw the thing that Every time they saw it, it was the thing that reminded them that he was, he was the favorite. Oh, there it goes, daddy's favorite. Sorry, punk. I mean, they were mad at him, and it wasn't even his fault. And you're laughing because you probably said stuff like that too. It wasn't even his fault. It was nothing that he had done wrong. It was nothing that he asked for. And they were jealous of him. And they resented him. And eventually, their jealousy turns to hate. Life lesson, when jealousy is left unchecked, it can lead to serious consequences. I said, when jealousy is left unchecked, it can lead to serious consequences. James chapter three, verse 14 through 16, it says, but if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. That's strong. That's strong, y'all. Verse 16. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. You know, Brian was talking about when you know the truth, I mean, it'll change the way you see things. You, you're going to see jealousy in a whole new way after reading this verse. Come on. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. Not good. There's another translation that says in the latter part of that verse, whenever you're trying to look better than others or get the better of others, things fall apart and everyone ends up at the other's throats. And that's why you have infighting and bickering and complaining. You're always complaining about each other and you're always, you know, bickering with one another. In Galatians chapter 5, jealousy is also listed as one of the works of the flesh. And in Proverbs, it's not going to be on the screen. In Proverbs chapter 14, it says, A tranquil heart gives life to the flesh, but envy makes the bones rot. That's why we can't be jealous or envious of other people. That's why we don't compare ourselves to other people. That's why we rejoice when someone else gets blessed. Come on. That's why we don't compete with one another. That's why we don't say things to make us look good and other people look bad because it never leads to anywhere good. Why did they get that? They never did that for us. They never did that for me. We've been here longer. That should be mine. That should have happened for me. Must be nice. And the Bible calls it earthly unspiritual and demonic just a side note if you have kids and you have children don't compare your kids to anybody else and don't put them down you'll never amount to anything ah you never do that right I wish you were more like your brother why can't you be like your sister you're just like your father you're just like your mother don't do that Speak life over your kids. Speak life over your children. And even if when you have to discipline them, 
though the discipline may be wrong, uh, different, not wrong, different for each child, you have to discipline him. Every child has to be disciplined, even if the discipline is different. Every child has to be disciplined. Every child has to be corrected. Every child has to have consequences, whether for good or for bad. Just a side note. Verse 5, let's keep reading. Now Joseph had a dream, and he told it to his brothers, and they hated him even more. So he said to them, please hear this dream which I have dreamed. There we were, building, binding sheaves in the field. Then behold, my sheaf arose and also stood upright. And indeed, your sheaves stood all around and bowed down to my sheaf. And his brothers said to him, shall you indeed reign over us? Or shall you indeed have dominion over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Life lesson, write this down, life lesson. Not everybody's going to like you. Not everybody's going to like you. Whether they have a reason or not, whether you've done anything to them or not, sometimes they don't even know you and they don't like you. Maybe they just heard about you and they don't even know for themselves, but they don't like you. Whatever the case may be, some people just won't like you. Don't spend a lot of time and energy trying to get people to like you who are never going to like you no matter what you do. In this case, his brothers didn't like him because he was favored by his father. They thought he was a tattletale. They didn't like the way he talked about his dreams. And now verse 5 says, Joseph had a dream. We just read it. And he told it to his brothers. And they hated him even more. And it's so weird because then verse 6 says, so he said to them, please hear this dream which I have dreamed. Okay, wait a minute. <laughs> Joseph had a dream. He said it to his brothers and they hated him. Right. So, that means, so since that happened, he said, hey, listen to this dream. I'm going to tell you my dream. It sounds to me like he's repeating himself. Why would you keep telling somebody something that doesn't like you or like what you're saying? I mean, did y'all, do y'all catch that? If, if he had a dream and he told it to him and they hated him, why then does it say, so he said to them, hey, please hear me this dream. I, I think he was rubbing it in. I don't know. I could be wrong. But that's what it sounds like. And he goes on to tell them how their sheaves bow to him, his sheep. And once again, the Bible says they hated him even more for his dream and for his words. Clearly, Joseph had some growing up to do. Amen. Life lesson. Write this down. When God shows you something, it's not always for everyone to know. At least maybe not now. Be careful who you share your dreams with. Telling the wrong person can delay your dream. You might get a negative response. You might end up having doubts. They may try to sabotage your dream. I'm just saying, you know, be a little careful who you share your stuff with. Share with godly, mature people who will encourage you. And I say that, but I don't mean share, you're just going to talk to people who are always just going to, you know, go along with whatever it is that you say. That's not what I'm saying. You're not just going to talk to people. You don't just look for people who will never confront you. That's not what I'm saying. Because you need that too. I mean, if you're sharing some elaborate thing that you're going to do for the Lord, and you're telling this to somebody, and you haven't got the basics down yet, I mean, you're telling them all these great things that you're going to do for God, and you can't even seem to get to church. And when you do, you can't even seem to get here on time. You haven't got the basics down yet. You know, you haven't got the basics down in your giving. You haven't got the basics down in your serving. I'm not going to encourage somebody to do something I know they're clearly not ready for. Joseph had a dream. And it was a dream from God. But he wasn't ready for it. Dreams will take you on a journey. They're not one-day trips. You'll hear people say, oh, they're an overnight success. There's really no such thing as an overnight success. It may seem like somebody from the outside looking in that it was an overnight success, but ask the person that actually lived it. And the decisions that you and I make, they're either going to take us to the dream or they're going to delay the dream. Life lesson, write this down. God will never build beyond what your character can withstand. God will never, get it loud and clear, build beyond what your character can withstand. Character is vital. 
You know, I was reading about skyscrapers, and when it comes to, I'm just going to quote some of the stuff that they said about sky, skyscrapers, because, it, man, it's so good. It says, when it comes to skyscrapers, to prevent natural forces from toppling them over, and listen with your spiritual ears while I'm reading this. Mega tall structures have to have a low center of gravity, and that's achieved by digging deep into the ground to find a soul sturdy enough to hold the weight of the building. Some of the world's tallest buildings, that means for some of those buildings that are really tall, and I, I, I looked some of them up, that means digging as deep as 279 feet deep as they're looking and searching for the bedrock. They're looking for something solid and strong, you know, that they can build on. Beneath the top loose soil, they got to go and dig deep so that they can build on a, a, on a strong foundation. They said... After surveying the construction site for soil composition, construction begins by digging a pit. And I was like, oh my gosh. We're talking about Joseph. How many of you know he found himself in a pit? It says, the size and the depth of the pit depends on how far down the bedrock lies. Our skyscrapers have proven that if you want to reach new heights, you must first dig deep. That one, that's just talking about skyscrapers. But it pertains to us too. If we want God to, to do mighty things in and through us, before he can take us high, man, we've got to be dug deep. I love this quote that I was just shared with. Your success stops where your character stops. You can never rise above the limitations of your character. Character matters character is vital without good character it'll destroy you or it'll destroy your dream god wants to bless us but he wants us to have the character to maintain the blessing he's a master builder and he builds things to last he's not going to build things that that are not to last and if we don't have character good character we run the risk of being crushed by the weight of the blessing God will never take you where your character can't sustain you. Verse 9. Then he dreamed still another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Look, I have dreamed another dream, and this time the sun, the moon, and the eleven stars bowed down to me. So he said it to his father and his brothers, and his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall your mother and I and brothers indeed come to bow down to the earth before you? And his brothers envied him. But his father kept the matter in mind. He just you know, kept and thought about it. I mean, he's just adding wood to the fire here. And for those of you who think that jealousy and envy won't lead you down a dark road, here you got 10 men willing to kill their brother because of a coat and a couple of dreams. It matters. It matters. And we'll see in a moment that their deep jealousy grows ugly and it grows into hate and it completely blinds them to what's right and what's wrong. As you keep reading the Bible, you'll see that Joseph's brothers go to Shechem to feed their father's flock and Jacob, the Bible says, sends Joseph to check on them and to report back. You know, they already don't like him. They already are jealous of him. They already think he's a tattletale. I'm not sure that his daddy should have sent him to go and check on him and report back. And the Bible says that when they saw him afar off, before he even came near them, they conspired to kill him. They said, there comes that dreamer. Come, therefore, let us kill him and cast him into a pit. And we'll just say that some wild animal devoured him. And then we'll see what happens with his dream. They crossed the line. And now they're conspiring to murder him. And this is serious. You know, the minute you find yourself coveting and comparing, competing, we got to nip it in the bud, y'all. Those are not good things. So you have the 17-year-old Joseph, the baby of the family, daddy's favorite, walking around in the reminder that he's the favorite, his loud coat. And they can't stand him. They can't stand that he's the only one with the special coat. They can't stand that he's his daddy's favorite. They can't stand that he's a tattletale. They can't stand that he's always walking around talking about his dreams. They're jealous of him. And that jealousy turns to hate. And they decide they're going to take him out once and for all. And now Joseph gives him another reason to hate him. He adds wood to the fire. And the straw that breaks the camel's back is that second dream. And if you go on and read, the Bible says that they stripped him of his tunic and threw him in an empty pit. 
They stripped him of that thing that represented favor in his life. You know, they stripped him of his tunic, but they couldn't take his favor. And you may get stripped of a lot of things, but God's favor is on you. If you're a Christ follower, God's favor is on you. And the world may take a lot of things from you, but they can't take the things that God gives you. They can't take your favor. And they throw him in this pit. And it's not on the screen, but in, the, in verse 25 it says, And they sat down to eat a meal. It's amazing that they could sit down and eat and their brothers in a pit. And it didn't seem to phase them. And they end up selling him to some saved slave traders that pass by. They take his tunic. They kill a goat. Dip, dip his tunic in that blood so, th so that they can take that home and tell their dad, hey. And then, then they do it. They take it home and they say, hey, uh, we found this. Do you know who that belongs to? Does, do you recognize this? Do you, th do you think that's your son's? And of course, Jacob does exactly what they thought he would and, and immediately says, oh my gosh. You know, something, some wild beast has devoured him. And the Bible says that he cried, he wept, and he couldn't be consoled. Joseph is taken to Egypt where he sold to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh. And I love what Genesis 39, verse 2 says. The Lord was with Joseph, and he was a successful man. You know, you start reading that, and you're like, wait a minute. I just read all this other stuff before I got to this verse. What do you mean? He was a successful man but read on it says the Lord was with Joseph and he was a successful man and he was in the house of his master the Egyptian and his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand so Joseph found favor in his sight and served him tell somebody he served him then he made him overseer of his house and all that he had and he put and all that he had he, he put under his authority tell somebody the Lord was with him Joseph served, he served well, y'all, and it was noticeable, so much so that he's made, put in charge of his master's house. Joseph served Potiphar. He didn't mope, he didn't gripe, he didn't complain. What do we do when we find ourselves in situations that we don't like? He didn't feel sorry for himself, he didn't throw a pity party and invite everybody to come over. The Bible says he served and he served well. This was Joseph, I believe, fighting for the promise because he knew that God was with him. Tell somebody, God is with me. The Bible goes on to say that Joseph was handsome in form and in appearance, and unfortunately, Potiphar's wife took notice of that. And she decides to make some moves on him. And I'm not talking about jiu-jitsu. I'm not talking about karate. Some other kind of moves. She bats her eyelashes. It didn't work. Puts a little shoulder thing, works the shoulder, it didn't work. It wasn't working. He turns her down and he refuses her because he says, man, how can I sin against God? And the Bible says, you know what? She kept at it. She didn't quit. And finally one day when all the guys are out of the house, the men of the house are out, Joseph goes in the house to go work. And there she comes. You know, sin is always going to keep presenting itself. It's always going to give you an opportunity. It's always going to try to entice you. And she grabs him by his clothes, and the Bible says he takes off running. How many of you know sometimes, you know, when temptation hits, you, you can't tiptoe away. You can't say, excuse me, uh, let me think about it. You can't, I'll be right back. No, you, sometimes you got to run. In fact, I think always you have to run. And that's what he did. The Bible says that he ran. She grabbed his cloak and she, he ran. So she's left with a piece of it in her hand or she's the whole thing. I don't know, but, he, but, but he, ran, he runs. And she lies. She gets so mad that he would deny. She lies about him and says that he sexually assaulted her and he's thrown into prison. Genesis 39, 21 says, but the Lord was with Joseph. I love it. I love it and showed him mercy and he gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison and the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners who were in the prison and whatever he did there y'all say whatever he did whatever he did there it was his doing he was in charge the keeper of the prison did not look into anything that was under Joseph's authority because the Lord was with him and whatever he did the Lord made it to prosper I mean, he had autonomy he had freedom he didn't have to be looked over and watched over. He could be trusted because he, he was a man of integrity, a man of character. 
We need to be like Joseph, where somebody doesn't have to be watching over us constantly. That we have freedom and autonomy to be all that God created us to be because we're doing things God's way. Because he knew the Lord was with him. Joseph fought for the promise. How did he fight for the promise? He served in prison and he served well. He didn't quit. He didn't let discouragement set in. He didn't have a pity party. You know what? When you know that God is with you, you'll fight for the promise. Whatever that thing is that God has for you, your destiny, those things that God has placed for you to do, when you know that God is with you, you'll fight for the promise. Tell somebody, God is with me. No matter where you find yourself in life, when Jesus is there, when he's in the situation, when you invite him into your life, everything changes. Here he is in prison, and immediately he begins to serve the warden, and the warden puts him in charge. Life lesson. Write this down. Serving others leads you to the dream God has for you. Serving others leads you to the dream God has for you. You know why? Because the dream is never just about you. The dream is never just about you. When God gives you a dream, it always involves other people. It always involves helping other people. When somebody shares a dream with you and they say it's a dream from God, if it doesn't involve other people, it's not a dream from God. While in prison, he ends up meeting the king's butler, the king's baker. You know, the baker's the one that does all the cooking. The butler's the one that tastes the food and tastes the drink before the king or before Pharaoh has it to make sure it's not poisoned. How would you like that job? If you drop dead, okay, I'm not going to drink it. I'm not going to eat it. Anyway, he meets these people in prison. Obviously, though, they were, they were top trusted people. They had, must have done something really bad to be in prison right now. And he meets them. Each of them has a dream. I'm going to try to, to speed the story up because there's so much. There's so much. I can't get to everything. But they have a dream. And the next day, jo- Joseph sees that they're sad. It's kind of funny because he goes, the Bible says that he asked him, why are y'all sad? I mean, come on. They're, everybody's in prison. They're in prison. He's in prison. And he notices they're sad and goes, why, why are y'all sad? Like, why the long faces? I mean, if anything, they could have said, well, I mean, we're in prison. You know, they go on. To, but Joseph wasn't like that. You see, Joseph, was, Joseph made the best of the situation. He wasn't a negative person. Anyway, they go on to tell him that they had a, that they each had, you know, separate dreams. They don't have an interpreter. So Joseph, I love his, his answer to them. He goes, well, don't interpretations come from God? Tell me what your dream is. And they go on, tell him the dream. He interprets the dream. He interprets the dream of one and says, in three days, you're out of here. Hey, by the way, when you, when you are, don't forget me. Tell Pharaoh about me. Other guy goes, wow, cool. What's mine? Looks at him, okay, in three days, you're going to die. Not good. Life lesson, write this down. Remember to stay humble and give God the glory. Remember to stay humble and give God the glory. I threw this in here because I love that it said that he said, don't interpretations come from God. He had a gift to interpret dreams, but he knew where the gift came from. God has given you gifts. God has given you talents, but it's not because of you. It's because of him. Anything that we can do, it's not because of us. It's because of him. And it's to bring honor and glory to to the kingdom. It's to bring honor and glory to Jesus, to the name of Jesus. And he was careful to say, hey, I mean, he did it. He interpreted the dream, but he was careful to say, and you'll see later on in scripture, he does the same thing with Potiphar. I mean, he's, uh, I mean, with, uh, with the Pharaoh, he's very careful to say, hey, it's God who's going to do it. Remember to stay humble and give God the glory. The Bible says that pride comes before the fall. The butler forgets him. The butler forgets him. Man, he's so happy. It happened just like Joseph said. He gets out of there and he forgets all about him. You know, sometimes the people that you help along the way on your journey to your dream are going to forget you. Sometimes they're going to let you down. Don't let that derail you. Don't let that take you out. You know, sometimes God has you on a journey. There's people that leave church because somebody offended them. Don't let people trip you up. People will fail you. God won't. I said, people will fail you. God won't. That's life lesson. Write it down. Two years go by and Pharaoh has a dream that troubles him. And he can't interpret it. He doesn't, can't find somebody to interpret it. I mean, he's got people that are supposed to be able to do this thing, and nobody seems to be able to help him. Two years have gone by, and finally, 
finally, the butler says, hey, oh yeah, I remembered, I just remembered something. I don't know. You know, back then, sometimes whenever they would ask their magicians or their people, whoever their people were that interpreted dreams, whenever they would ask them to interpret a dream, sometimes if they couldn't interpret it, it was like, off with your head. You're no good to me. You know, get out of here then. If you're, you're no use to me. I wonder if that went through the butler's head because nobody was like being able to interpret anything. And he was like, uh, have you found somebody? Uh, no, sir. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I know somebody. And he remembers Joseph. He remembers Joseph. Man. When no one could interpret, finally, Joseph's name gets brought up. He tells Pharaoh how Joseph correctly interpreted his dream. And Pharaoh says, you know what? Bring him to me. Bring him over here. I want to I talk to that guy. And Pharaoh recognizes that God is with Joseph. God, Fa- Joseph interprets his dream. And Pharaoh is able to recognize that God is with Joseph. And the Bible says, and I'm making a long story short because there's so much, there's so much, that he puts him in charge. He puts him in charge of his house, of all the people over all of Egypt. And he's only second to him, to Pharaoh. And the Bible says that Joseph was 30 years old when this came to pass. 30 years old when this came to pass. He got the dream at 17. He hung in there because he knew that God was with him. He didn't quit because he knew that God was with him. There's a quote that says, the price to be paid by God's heroes is long-term commitment. Where do we find that anymore? At the first sign of trouble, people turn and run. When it gets a little hard, people turn and run. When it doesn't work out the way that I thought it would, people turn and run. When you offend me, I'm going to turn and run. When I don't like what you said and I don't like what you did and I don't agree with you, I'm going to turn and run. Where's long-term commitment? He was 17 when he got the promise, and he went through a lot, but he stayed committed. When you know that God is with you, you'll fight for the promise. He knew God was with him. And he fought for the promise. You know, maybe we need to know and we need to realize that God is with us. Maybe if we knew that God was with us, we'd fight for the promise too. Eventually, like everyone else, Joseph's brothers end up in Egypt to go buy grain because just like he he said, there was a famine. Genesis 42, 6 says, Now Joseph was governor over the land, and it was he who was sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brothers came and bowed down before him with their faces to the earth. And we see here the promise is being fulfilled. You know, they got there. They didn't even recognize him. He knew who they were. They didn't know who he was. And we see as they're bowing down to him, as they're coming to ask for grain, we see that the promise is coming to pass. All these years later, the promise is coming to pass. You know, the Bible says that he eventually, he, I mean, there's a series of things that he did there to kind of test and see where his brothers were at, to kind of see where their heart was, to see if there had been any change since the time that they had sold him into slavery. A bunch of events have happened there. You, you'll, you can go read it in the Bible of, of the different things that he did. But eventually, eventually the Bible says that he tells everybody to leave the room, obviously, except his brothers. He tells everybody to leave so that he can let them know who he is because he knows they don't know who he is. And he tells them how God had him there for a reason. He tells them how he's going to provide for them and how he's going to provide for their families. You know, eventually his father Jacob dies and his, and his brothers start getting scared that, you know what, man, dad's gone now. He probably didn't do nothing to us because dad was still here. Dad's gone now, man. I, I, I he, I think he might take revenge on us. And Genesis in chapter 50 says, when Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they started thinking of a way that they could save themselves just in case he wanted to take revenge. I want to read what it says here. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, perhaps Joseph will hate us and may actually repay us for all the evil which he did to the which we did to him. So they sent messengers to Joseph saying, before your father died, he commanded saying, thus you shall say, you shall say to Joseph, I beg you, please forgive the trespasses of your brothers. I mean, they sent a message saying from their dad saying, you know, forgive your brothers, forgive your brothers. Don't do anything to your brothers. Please forgive them. It says here that Joseph wept when they spoke to him. 
Verse 18, then his brothers also went down and fell before his face and they said, behold, we are your servants. And here's such a powerful uh, scripture in the Bible. Joseph said to them, do not be afraid for I am in the place for I am I in the place of God. But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. Now, therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. You know, Joseph had completely forgiven them. He completely forgave them. Whether they deserved it or not, whether they asked for it or not, he forgave them. He didn't throw things in their face. He didn't hold it over their head. He forgave them. Even here, as he's forgiving his brothers for the terrible things that they caused in his life, he is fighting for the promise. God was able to bring good things out of everything negative that happened to Joseph. Joseph's experiences taught him that God is faithful when we trust God, that he is faithful to his promises. Joseph demonstrated faith and courage no matter what the challenge. Y'all know, because he knew God was with him. Tell somebody, God is with me. You know, when you know that God is with you, you're going to fight for the promises of God. You're going to fight for the promise. This morning, I want you to know that Joseph had a dream, and it wasn't just any dream. It was a God dream. You can have dreams that are not of God, and you can have God dreams. This was a God dream, and you know it was a God dream because it involved helping other people. God has a dream for you, too. And you'll know it's a dream from God because it'll involve helping other people. It won't be just about you. It's not just about getting money. It's not just about me getting a successful career. It's not me just getting notoriety and being, you know, everybody knows my name. One day everybody's going to know who I am. No, one day I want everybody to know who he is. That's how you know that a dream is from God because it's not just about you, it's about him. If everything that we're doing in our lives, it just revolves around us, then it's not from God. We want a dream from God. You should have a dream from God. Joseph had a dream from God. You want one too. Joseph served his way to his dream. You and I will serve our way to our dreams too. And not everybody like Joseph. Not everybody's going to like us. But as long as God is on our side, I said, if, as long as God is on our side, we're in good company. If God be for us, who can be against us? Who dare be against us? If God is for you, act like it. If you know that God is with you, act like it. You know, we get so worried. We get so flipped out about things that are happening in our lives. And I think everybody in here has experienced troubles and trials. Maybe you're going through something right now, but we don't have to be afraid because we know that God is with us. Tell somebody, God is with me. God is with me. God has a dream. God has a destiny for your life. But if you're going to fulfill it, you have to grow up. You're going to have to grow up. We have to grow up in the things of God. We can't stay baby Christians all of our lives. God has a dream and he has a destiny and he wants us to grow so that we can get to that thing. And that means our character has to grow. That means we have to have the character of Christ, amen? So that he can build because he's a master builder and he's not gonna build where there's no character. Tell somebody, God is with me. People will fail you. God will never fail you. God will see you through. He's not a failing God. He's true to his word and he's true to his promises. Joseph kept God first. You and I need to keep God first. When God is first in our life, the Bible says, Matthew 6, 33, everything else falls into place. When people are going through things, I always tell them, Matthew 6, 33, it. Matthew 6, 33, it. Put God first. Every area of your life will fall into place when God is first. Joseph kept God first. You should keep him first too. I believe God is looking for people who will risk it all for the kingdom. Who will risk it all. You know, we'll take a lot of risks in life. But will we take them for Jesus? People will do a lot of things. But will you do it for Jesus? This life that we live, it's for him. Think of your life. Think about the things that you're doing. Think about the things that you put your energy and your time into. Think about the things that you lean on and you trust and you see as your source. Is your source your job? Is your source that person you're dating? Is your source your spouse? Is your source things? Or is your source God? Joseph had a dream. And it was a God dream. It wasn't about him. It wasn't all about him. It involved other people. 
God has a dream for each one of us and it involves other people. It involves souls that need to be one for the kingdom. It involves lives that if we don't do something about it, they're not going to heaven. What are we doing to make a difference? This morning, this morning, we need to make a decision that we're going to be about the Father's business. That everything that we do, that everything that we say revolves around Him. Well, I can't do that. I have this job. I'm not a preacher. You don't have to be a preacher. You just got to be a Christ follower. If you've got Jesus, your assignment is to do wherever God has placed you, whatever you can do to build God's kingdom, to build His house. And when we build His house, He'll build ours. When we are about the Father's business, He's always about ours. He's always looking out for us. We serve a good, good Father, and He deserves our faithfulness. Joseph was faithful to the Lord. We need to be faithful to the Lord. Maybe you're in here this morning and you haven't even done step one. You don't have a full-on relationship with Jesus. Maybe you've never fully surrendered your life. to. Maybe you've given pieces. Maybe you've given him your problems as you haven't given him yourself. This morning, would you do that? If you're here this morning and you don't have a full-on relationship with Jesus, would you do that this morning? Would you trust this God? You know, this isn't just a, a cute little story that we read about the, in the Bible. I mean, he went through some serious stuff. And all along the way, he kept the faith. All along the way, he kept his heart right. All along the way, he honored Jesus. All along the way, he knew that God was with him and he fought for the promise. When you know that God is with you, you'll fight for the promise. And God's with you the minute that you say yes to a relationship with him. This morning, would you say yes to him? Is there something going on in your life that you need God's help with? Don't try to do it by yourself. Say yes to a relationship with Jesus. With every head bowed, bowed and every eye closed, if that's you and you say, you know what? I want God to, in my situation. I want God in my life. I want to put him in first place. I want to start living my life revolving around him, not trying to get God to revolve around my schedule. If that's you and you want a full-on relationship with Jesus, a God who will be with you no matter where you find yourself. Would you just lift your hand really high? I want to pray with you and for you. Just lift your hand. I see your hand. I see your hand. I see your hand. I see your hand. Lift it high. I see your hand. I see your hand. I see your hand. I see your hand over there. I see your hand back there. I see your hands. More than that, God sees your hands. If you're on the other side of that camera, lift your hand. God sees your hand too. He wants to move in your situation. There's so much that God did for Joseph. And I couldn't even cover it all. There's so much more. There's so much that God wants to do for you. There's so much he's done. Things behind the scenes that you're not even aware of, but there's so much more that he wants to do. Will you give him your all? Lift your hands again really high. Tell God, I mean business. I want to surrender to you. Even if you feel like you can't do it and you're not sure how it's going to work, will you just give him a chance? Lift your hand high on the other side of that screen. Lift your hand high. And I want all of you to repeat after me. Say, Dear Lord, today... I surrender my life to you. Come into my life. Make me new. Change me from the inside out. Make me more like you. I give you all of me. I surrender every area of my life to you. Have your way. Today I receive you as my Lord and my Savior. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for your mercy. And thank you for your grace. I thank you, Lord, that after today, my life will never be the same. In Jesus' name, y'all give the Lord a praise this morning. Give him a praise.